picking up from where we left off in Ephesians chapter 5, we will turn to Colossians 3.18, which is a repeat of what was said in Ephesians 5 about raising our daughters. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. And we're not talking about sons. We're not talking about husbands. So it's repeated. Submission to the husband by the wives. Got to make sure that our daughters, when they choose or pick that guy, you better make sure he is worthy and she wants and is willing to submit to that man because it's a Bible order and he's not to be bitter against her Three eighteen, as it is fit in the Lord even as unto the Lord even as unto the Lord this is not a loophole phrase scripture with scripture wives to submit to their husband as if it were Jesus Christ asking That man is an ambassador of Jesus Christ in many ways. And as a father, we are. As Christian fathers that we are, the only God they're going to see in our life, God the Father, is going to be played out in our roles in our family. We talked about last time, asking is, is prayer, giving. It's what God does to us. Saying no is what God does. Not now answering. It's what God does. It's what we're to do. Show love, compassion, forgiveness. That's what God does. That's what we're to do as husbands. And how this is hated among American women. And growing worldwide. They will judge wrong and sinners before Jesus Christ. The number three breakdown of marriage is rebelling against the word of God. That's what Eve did. God told them not to eat the fruit and she rebelled against the word of God. And look at the mess we're in. If the man she's to seek rebels against the word of God, seek him no more. Rebellion against the word of God is trouble, danger that we as fathers need to look in the male counterpart of our daughters that they see. And then husbands, they, they got the idea according to the Bible. Love your wives bitter we're to teach our daughters not to let the wedge of bitterness enter into that marriage see a wedge is a triangular tool starts off with a very fine point and the opposite side is big and wide now you don't take that big wide and throw it into a log. No, you start off the very, very th thinnest part of that wedge and you just put it on the log and give it a ta couple taps with a hammer. Alright? Now, it's fastened to the log unless somebody comes along and removes it. That's bitterness. You can't put that in your relation. You can't put bitterness anywhere. You can't let it be put into your life, bitterness, and let it freestand. Because if you remove that bitterness, you got a mark in the log. You got a mark in your life. That that wedge of bitterness, just don't even grab it. Leave it alone. It's like sin. And they use the illustration of a nail in a in a wood. All right, you take the nail, you hammer it to the wood. All right, you plead the blood of Jesus Christ, First John one nine, and the hammer takes the nail out. But you look at that wood, 
the hole is still there. Bitterness is a seed of corruption. Now, as I said, you got the wedge in the lock. A, a, something comes across whatever made you bitter. Wow! You smack it again. It goes in deeper. And then some other time, bam! You smack it. It goes in deeper. Bam! You say, and one of these days, that whack of that wedge is going to split that log. You've taken something that's supposed to cleave, and now you cleavered it. Women teach them when it says, Husbands be not bitter against your wife. Wives do not cause your husband to be bitter. Give him no excuse and no reason. If he will be bitter, let it be of his own accord, of his own sin. And no blame. So, through. Ephesians, uh, the Colossians 4, 18 to 22. Let's read it again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your own, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, employees, obey all that, all things that your masters according to the flesh, not with eyes, serve, not with So the biblical order with Ephesians 5.20 and Colossians 4.18 and 22, God the Father, number one. That's the first commandment, God first. Jesus Christ, his son. Next, the husband. Next, the wife. Next, the children. Next. The career that's the biblical foundation of a fruitful joyful family that is the foundation the steps the chain of command for a church never ever never put them out of order That's the order prescribed by God. If that order is broken, that is your fault. You have disobeyed the word. And notice when we're talking about this, there is no family but the husband, the wife, and the children. Career never comes before the spouse. Career never comes before the children. You can lose your job. You better have a family that will help and support and love you if you lost that job that you want to reach and you want to conquer all barriers. You want to climb all the ladders of success. Yeah, and then once that job is gone and your family's been gone from you a long time because you don't even want to have anything to do with them. At least if the job's going and you properly set off what God has told you to do in the family, at least your family would be supported and loving and caring and prayer together where you can pray and God will answer. Children never come before the spouse. They will grow up and they will move out. They grow up, they move out. Who's the one going to be left behind? Your spouse. Well, if you've given it all to your children and not your spouse, when they go, what do you expect? The same absence you've been giving your spouse through the years. Now all of a sudden everything's going to be hunky-dory. Everything's going to be, no, it won't. Now, Numbers 30, verse 3 and 16 through 16. We're going to look at something here about the wife, the daughter, the father, and the husband. Number 30, well, I've been saying this, I've been saying it, and now 
I'm going to show you scripture. Numbers 30, verse 3 to 16. If a woman vow a vow unto the Lord, and bind herself by bond, being in her father's house, that's what we're talking about right now, her teenage daughter, she's in your house, in her youth, teenage, and her father, you or me, hear her vow, and her bond wherein she has bound her soul. Remember, remember the marriage is called a bond? Remember we talked about that in 1 Corinthians? The bond of marriage? Tied to not? Remember those references? But look how it shows up here. Here's your daughter. I want to get married. I want to make a vow. I want to say I do. I want to be tied to Mark. The, the, the not. And her father shall hold his peace at her. Then all her vows shall stand. Every bond wherein she has bound her soul shall stand. You hear she she wants to do something for the Lord. I'm just fixing my chair, forgive me. And you don't say nothing. That's allowing that vow. Well, if this marriage you approve or you don't approve of that guy, you don't open your mouth. That's saying, I agree. I am for it. But if her father disallow, he says no. In the day that he heareth. So this is something in numbers that you got to react as soon as you hear and pray. Right, Nehemiah, the king said, well, what's wrong with you? Oh, Lord God, help me, please. And then God gave him the answer. See, you got to do a Nehemiah right here. And the day that he heareth not any of her vows or her bonds, wherein she has bound her soul, shall stand. The Lord shall forgive her because her father disallowed it. There's the power of the father that we've already read. Oh, I'm going to marry this guy. Oh, no, you're not. As your father, I say no. That's the power. Well, Dad, I think I'm going to make myself you know, a virgin for the rest of my life for the Lord. No, you're not. You don't know. As of right now, you, you, you call yourself a virgin for the Lord, but we don't know about tomorrow. That's the father's power over his daughter right now, you and me. If she had at all a husband, all right, now she's married. When the vow or when she vowed or uttered out of her lips, wherein she has bound her soul, she's married. She's going to do something. She has set something. She's going to sign a loan paper. She's going to sign a mortgage. She's going to sign a card note. She's going to pledge something at church. And her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it. Then her vow shall stand and her bonds wherein she bound her soul shall stand. All right. Her husband hears it. We need to teach our daughters that when she gets married, the power of the father removes to the power of the husband. We need to teach our daughters that. That's Bible. We've seen it over and over. Now, if she says something and her husband hears it, and he, God says the husband agrees. Even if it's stupid, even if it's sinful, even if it's wrong. If the husband doesn't say anything, just like the father didn't say anything, that is the approval. Fathers and husbands, if it's a sin, you will bear that sin unless you first John 1, 9. But you be not, this, be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. The tragedy of you being silenced with your daughter may have a reaping in your life if you don't speak up. Don't go 20 years down the road, oh, I wish I had said something. The Bible says, say something. You're without excuse now, Dad. I am without excuse. I had just read it to you in the Bible. Don't go 30, down the, 30 years down the road, oh, I wish I was, you're supposed to. And by you not saying anything, that's approval. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips, wherein she bound her soul or of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. All right. She goes to church. The 
thing I'm getting, get, it's not all churches do, but, you know, make a pledge to the church or a missionary. Two weeks later, she said, you know, honey, I, I, I pledged $20 to this missionary or the, this church building fund. No. Now, it's two weeks late, later, but you just heard it. Dad or husband, you just heard it. At that moment, no, I don't allow that. I know what the dangers of pledging is. And we've got studies about pledging. No. Even though it's two weeks later, you as a husband or as a dad had just heard it. And that moment God's giving you, are you going to allow that? Or are you going to disallow it? How about if the wife comes up to her husband and says, you know what? I'm divorcing you. And the husband walks away. Oh, me. What did you just do? What did you just do? Should have spoke up. Didn't you? Shouldn't you? But every vow of a widow, we talked about the widow. She has no husband. She has no father. And of her that is divorced. Uh-oh. Wherein they have bound their souls shall stand against it. So if a widow or a divorced woman says she's going to do something for God, to God, loan paper, car note, make whatever, mortgage, whatever it is, I'm going to take a bottle of pills and kill myself. There is no male authority over that woman, husband or father. God says, okay, you bound your soul. If she vowed and in her husband's house and bound her soul by a bond with an oath, she signs that vacuum cleaner deal. I fell for this one. My wife, oh, I'm going to have these people. I was going to prison one night and my first wife, I'm going to have these people. It's one of our friends, you know, have these people come over and they're going to just show me the vacuum cleaner and... I'm not going to buy it. I said no, but she did. Come home, and here's this big box. I said, what's that? Oh, it's the vacuum cleaner. I thought I told you not to buy it. I thought I told you you weren't even supposed to be here. And it became a debt that we could never finish paying. Wives, when your father, wives, daughters, forgive what I just said, daughters, when your father says no, you're to do the no. Be not deceived, God's not mocked, whatsoever a man sow, that he shall also reap. When you get a red hiney, dad told you no. Mom told you no. Wives, now you... If your husband says no, and you do, be not deceived, God's not marked, whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. And that works for yes, too. And her husband heard it and held his peace at her and disallowed her vow, disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand. Every bond wherewith she is bound, her soul shall stand. You're at work. <coughs> Somebody comes to the door with Psychopedia's magazine. Somebody, she signs it. And when you come home that day, two weeks, one month, and then you find out. No. Uh, and you don't say nothing as the husband. God bounds you to that, that bond that she set for you. But if her husband has utterly made them void on the day he heard them, on the day he heard, it doesn't have to be the day that she done it, it's when he finds out. Some marriages I know, maybe the husband should have done that when he first got that credit card bill. Uh-huh. 
when Visa MasterCard comes in. What is this? We can't afford this. Back to the store. But see, he doesn't say nothing, does he? And now he's bound to that credit card bill. Uh-oh. Trouble. Trouble. On the day he heard it, then what sort of proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul? She shall not stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord shall forgive her. Now, that credit card bill, it comes in. Don't say, oh, you know, honey, I don't allow this, and then I don't have to pay it. No, you got to return it. But she comes to you a month later and said, hon, I've talked to the person at church, and when I can, Sunday night, I'm going to give myself for the nursery duty and you say, yeah okay that sounds good just now see you've allowed it your wife comes up to you and Saturday you know we'll get together as a women and we're gonna go play poker and we're gonna go to a men's night out at, at, at the place and all that and you say hmm. okay well you don't say nothing that's a bond that that so you gotta, you gotta watch out for ignoring your wife and listening to what she has to say. Because you're ignoring your deaf ears may get you into trouble and get her in trouble. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from the day to day, then he establishes all her vows and all her bonds which are upon her. He confirms them because he held his peace. Silence is confirming. So don't go 30 years down at all. I wish I had said something. Too late. God said you had your cho choice back then. But if he shall anyways make them void after that he has heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. Oh, look at that, girls. Look what we need to teach our daughters. She opens up her mouth for an oath which the Bible says you're not to. You shouldn't. You better think about it. You put iniquity upon your father or your husband. Iniquity. You know what that is? That's sin. Jezebel ordered Naboth dead. And God told Elijah, I want you to go speak to Ahab. And what's the charge? You killed Naboth. No, 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 wait a minute. Jezebel killed him. Yeah, but Ahab was married to Jezebel. And what we see from Numbers 30. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses. Between a man and his wife. Between the father and his daughter being yet in her youth in her father's house the power god has given in the bible in scripture for the father is you have authority and the power over your daughter that is yours and no one else's that girl goes on marries a man becomes her husband you transfer all that power as a father to that husband Notice what we read. First the husband. I mean, first the father. Then she got married. And now it's the husband. Divorce and widow, they have no man over them. Their bonds are, whew, it, it's, that's it. No one to stop it. No one to make it clear. No one to make it void. No one to say, no, you can't do that. But the daughter or the wife is under one man. Her father. And if she's married, forget the father, the husband. So dads, you have no right to go into your daughter's house, father's house, oh, excuse me. You have no right to go into your daughter's house, which is her husband's house. She's married. And say, I don't like that dress you're wearing, throw it out. I don't like it. 
you have no power of authority over that. That's her husband. If he says she can wear it, she can wear it. Well, it's revealing. That has nothing to do with you no more. Now, on the other hand, you buy your daughter a dress. Her husband sees a dress and says, that thing is ugly. It's disgusting. You take it back to the store or you put it in the closet. I don't ever want to see you wear that. As her father, you gotta obey what her husband. I don't care what her feeling. Her husband said, "Don't wear it." He is in charge of your daughter now. She is no longer your daughter. She's now a wife. The Bible said, remember in First Corinthians, said she's either a wife or a virgin. That's the authority set by God. And if there's a problem, you got a problem against God. And that's what now don't like national organization. They don't want to be under the subjection of no man. Then you just keep on rebelling against God and stand before either judgment to lose. According to the Bible. See, husbands, fathers, we just don't get married just to have sex. We get married to have responsibility and cares and concerns to our spouse and children. It's no easy thing. It's a very hard job. And Paul says, I would rather you be single. I spare you. There will be much trouble. Remember he said? Not only fighting back and forth at, at times like that. And the arguments do happen. But God has laid upon the man much authority. Consequences. Results. Eve took the fruit. Eve ate the fruit. Eve talked to the serpent. She gave the fruit to her husband. He did eat with her. God shows up. Adam, what happened? You know, her over there. That woman you made. That woman you gave me. Read Genesis 3. He blames her and blames God. That woman, she's the one that caused all the problems. Okay. Eve, what's the problem? Well, you know that serpent you made. He had a conversation with me. It was his fault. The serpent. Man, if he had somebody to blame, he, he's sitting there kicking his legs in the sand like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And God curses that serpent and removes his legs and his arms if that's what he had. Even in the millennium, that's another Bible study, that, that serpent is cursed. He turns to Eve. Eve, you're cursed. Sorrow, childbearing in pain, right? Right. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Hold on. There's something else. Wasn't there uh, pain, sorrow, birth, sorrow? Oh, uh, let's see. Genesis 3. Let's check the Bible. Let's see what the Bible says. Oh, unto woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's the result of the curse. Your submission to your husband is because of the curse. How's that? You know why? Because Eve didn't submit. Eve didn't listen. So God said, Adam, you're now in charge. Protect that woman. All right. So God took off that afternoon. No, he didn't. He turned to the man and said, I'm cursing you. Sweat. Agony. To get your food. And then you're going to die. Why? Because your wife did something you weren't supposed to do. You were in charge. I told you, Adam, do not eat that fruit. Well, she, I don't I want to hear the excuses. There is no excuses with God. The serpent got it, Eve got it, and the husband got it. Just like Ahab. So another breakdown in the family is, who is in charge? God, Jesus Christ, 
the husband, the wife, the child, or children. So, if it's our daughter, God, Jesus Christ, the father, the mother, and the child is under them. If it's the wife, God, Jesus Christ, the husband, the wife. See? There's an order. Children today are being told they've got rights and stuff like that. And look where they are today. They're totally messed up. They don't know nothing from nothing and don't have any idea. And that's sad. You know, I hated school. It was so hard. Learning new things. Every time I went to a new grade, we had to learn new things. I had to do it because there were tests coming up. But you know what? At 47 years old, I'm thankful that they had me do that. I'm thankful my mom drilled me over my spelling words, even though I had much trouble. But if I spelled cat, K-A-T, I was wrong. And I got a big, fat, red X. And I had to take that paper home and show my mom and have her sign it. To make sure I did better next time. And I'm happy with my life today. I know things. I know I have three diplomas, four diplomas. High school, seminary, actually got many diplomas from my seminary, but one final one from my seminary. I've got two coming from Daytona State College. I can read my name and I can read everything on that paper. And I'm not ashamed. Children are to be under the adults, the Bible authority. And when you break that up, then you got the problem. Then you got the problem. Let me see if we got. We're going to stop there. We'll come back again. And next time, Lord willing. We're going to look at examples of Bible women for our daughters. The Bible gives us examples. You can't just say, you know, everything you said so far was hot air. Everything I said is from the Bible. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you Bible examples. It's Bible. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. John 1 says, Jesus Christ is the word. 1 John, Jesus Christ is the word. Let's stay in the word. 